Welcome to Leadership Lessons from the Negro Leagues. My name is Steve today. I'm pleased to have as our guest, Vanessa Ivy Rose. Vanessa is a granddaughter of Baseball Hall of Famer Norman Turkey Stearns. Vanessa is here to talk about her new book, Hall of Fame DNA, The Legacy of Norman Turkey Stearns. Vanessa, welcome to Leadership Lessons from the Negro Leagues. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. I am delighted you're here and I can't wait to talk about the book. Now, what made you decide to write a book on your grandfather? Well, it's been something that I've been thinking about for a really long time. I actually teach English, so I teach about books all the time and I'm always, you know, introducing students to new authors and new ideas. Um, and so I was like, I should write a book, you know, and I, I thought about this for a long time, but people kept encouraging me in the family and also people that I knew just in society that really like baseball and would see my writing and my posts on social media. And they're like, okay, we're still waiting for your book. Uh, whenever you release it, you know, we'll buy it. So it was kind of a work in progress for a long time, probably, you know, two decades. But um, I finally decided once I really wanted to write about grandpa that, you know, I could use my laser focus to uh, honor his legacy and pay tribute to the man he was on and off the field. So it was something I wanted to do for my family, but also because I'm really proud to be his granddaughter. You're proud to be his granddaughter. And you mentioned that you're an English teacher and education was really important to your grandfather, wasn't it? Absolutely. Um, I didn't know that originally when I was younger. And as I continued to grow, when I would hear more stories from my grandmother and from my mom and from my aunt, they would always talk about how much he valued education and how much he would tell little kids in the neighborhood to stay in school when he would walk around the neighborhood and and see people playing ball or just hanging out. He always, you know, encouraged people, hey, I really want you to stay in school. And he would even give away his bats and his balls and his equipment to little kids because he wanted to nurture them and, and be a role model. So, I mean, it just runs in the family with education. My grandmother was a teacher, my mom, my aunt, we have so many teachers in the family, it's ridiculous. So well, that that's a great legacy to your grandfather then. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. You know, I was glad now, to hear that too because of the, you know, sports and um education connection of being a student athlete and just looking at, you know, embracing young people today in my role as a high school teacher. And also that was something that I embarked upon when I was playing ball in school. I played basketball in high school and went on to play in college. So I've always valued being a, a student athlete. And so I was really glad to see that my grandfather actually is the one that started me on that path. That, that's excellent. I I got the impression reading the book that it was a, it was a love story from you to your grandfather. Would that sound right? Absolutely. I never met him because he passed away in 1979 and I was born in 1983. So Ever since I was little, I've always envisioned what a conversation with him would look like. And I've always wanted to see him play. And I had so many questions for him. And I would really get frustrated over the years about not being able to talk to him. And I start feeling really sad about it. But then I say, you know, I have to practice what I preach. I tell students all the time that writing is a creative outlet. It's therapeutic. You could be as creative as you want to be. You could put all your dreams on paper. And so I say, you know what? Why am I not following my own advice? I need to make sure that I write something to my grandfather. That's a way that I can have a conversation with him right now and honor his legacy. So uh, that's really where the idea for the book came about. Right. And one of the things you mentioned in the book, and I want to—I don't want to spoil it. We're going to just kind of scratch the surface because we okay. encourage everybody to buy it. <laughs> but yeah, there was a point when you heard his voice for the first time. And that really moved me the way you described it. Yeah, you know, it was something I never thought about. Um, a good friend, family friend of ours named Dave Mesry, who's a writer. He's part of the Hamtramck Stadium grounds crew. And he loves baseball through and through. Uh, he came across the audio recording and he had um, a woman at Wayne State restore it. And so once he restored the audio, you know, he was like, okay, I'm going to send it to you. I'll send it to your family. And, 
you know, I just had never thought about being able to hear my grandfather's voice. I only knew him through pictures and through stories. Uh, so I just thought that was just something I would never have the opportunity to do in terms of being able to hear his voice. So when I heard that, as I mentioned in the book, I mean, it was a very emotional experience and something that I'll never forget. That's that's something we don't think about when we think about the Negro Leagues. You know, we know that's where African-Americans played professional baseball when they were excluded from the major leagues. But right. I grew up. I've heard Babe Ruth speak. I've we've there's a legendary speech by Lou Gehrig. I've heard Ty Cobb speak. But I think right. the only Negro League player I've ever heard speak is Buck O'Neill. Other than that, they were never recorded. Yeah, so much of their footage is lost, right? Or just didn't exist. And especially in this day and age when we can see everything on ESPN, we're bombarded by sports clips and we have so much, probably more than what we need uh, in terms of being able to see the footage of the players and their behind the scenes life too. Now with social media, it's just shocking to me that we have little to nothing. Uh, they're almost rendered invisible in terms of being in the Negro leagues. And so that just speaks volumes about, you know, how far um, people in power went to ensure that they could be erased. Right. Right. Well, what I like now, and it, it's, it's growing every day. It's, it's not going to be a race because people are talking about the Negro leagues more and more, yeah. and we may never hear their voices, but the world is learning about the Negro leagues. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, as Absolutely. far as your grandfather goes as a man, what I gathered from your book is his essence was humility, humility, loyalty, and integrity. Would I have that right? You got it. You got it. <laughs> uh, I, You know, those are things that my grandmother shared with me. We were blessed to have her until she was 95 years old. So she shared a lot about his legacy and who he was as a man. And she had a very sharp memory. My goodness, she could <laughs> recite oh, yeah. so many things, uh, everything from poetry and educational things to, you know, experiences that she had that were both um, positive or negative. Right. And so she shared so much of my grandfather's legacy uh, with me and the way that you described him is exactly how she would have described him, too, as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you talked about how they met. They were quite a couple, quite a pair. And they were they were introduced by your mother's uncle, Ted Double Duty Radcliffe. So yeah, that was my grandmother's uncle. Your grandmother's uh, uncle. That's yeah, right. Yeah, grandmother's right. great. Yeah. So we had this baseball connection, right? Just having two awesome Negro leaguers within the family. And so uh, you know, my grandmother originally lived in Alabama. And so when they were down there, she had met him. Um through double duty, but then also when she moved to Detroit and then grandpa also moved to Detroit, they got reconnected through my grandmother's sister, Eleanor, and her uh, husband. So they would start hanging out, you know, in the same social circle, so to speak. And then uh, their friendship grew into a love. So uh, I was just glad to see, you know, that baseball essentially brought them together because that's very poetic and it makes sense in terms of grandfather's legacy, right? Right, right. You mentioned some of the complications too. That, um, well, first of all, your grandmother had a lot of interests. So her number one interest was not finding a husband. She was her own woman. Uh, yeah. You also talked about some dynamics like the term colorism, which mm -hmm. I personally don't know a lot about, but you explained it in the book and it was it, it, it was something that was pretty jarring. And I, I I was wondering if you can explain that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So especially within the black community, um, colorism relates to darker skinned people being treated more harshly and lighter skin or fairer skinned people being treated more favorably. And so my grandmother was very light skinned. Um, not to say that she was treated more favorably, because, again, she grew, grew up in Alabama and the racist experiences that she shared with me um, would give people nightmares, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it just goes to show that no matter how dark or light skin you were, um, that being black was essentially 
uh, the problem. And I know many people have described it as, you know, the one drop rule of having one drop of black blood, meaning that almost that you were cursed and living a horrific lifestyle as a result of the way people viewed race back then. But um, when you're looking at colorism, and especially what I talked about in the book, my grandfather was very dark skinned. And so um, my grandmother's family initially did not respond well to that because they had been groomed by society and conditioned by society to, you know, favor light skinned people and kind of want uh, light skinned people to be a part of their family. And so, you know, the idea of grandma and grandpa being together had to kind of grow on the family. But as you mentioned, my grandmother was very independent. She was very headstrong. Um, she was a very fair-minded person too. And something like the color of someone's skin was not going to deter her uh, from marrying them or treating them with respect. And so that's something that I really, really feel proud of. Um, and when I was writing the book, it was something that I felt proud of too. It was like a silver lining within that horrific story, right? Um, but they had so many different experiences. And there's one that I didn't even mention in the book, um, just to kind of showcase how colorism worked within their um, relationship. My grandmother talked about one time when they were driving um, in the in the car and a police officer pulled them over and asked my grandmother, are you OK? Is this man bothering you? And so the police officer believed that my grandmother was white because she was so light skinned right, and thought that she was in the car being harmed by a dark skinned man, you know, a dark skinned black man, um, not knowing that he would be a Hall of Famer someday, not knowing that he was a man of integrity and humility, as you mentioned, right? But just literally seeing what looked like a black man and a white woman driving together during uh, a time when segregation and discrimination was still mm -hmm. very evident in society. And again, just thinking about, you know, like I said before that giving people nightmares. That's something that I think about where I'm like, wow, I can't believe that my grandparents as a married couple were forced to deal with that type of discrimination and racism. It was pretty brutal um, mm -hmm. and unfair to them as a loving, very spiritual, very like respectful, amazing couple. Mm -hmm. um, the, they had to go through stuff like that just really speaks volumes about our history. Mm -hmm. It, it it, it's an amazing story and at some points it's uplifting and at some points it's scary and it just uh it, it's very i said earlier it's jarring is what it is yeah. and i yeah. think that's uh, uh but as far as your mom we mentioned or your grandmother we mentioned your dad was uh humility loyalty and integrity and then you mentioned in the book your mom was family faith and schooling so it, that was what was important to her at all times. Is that correct? Yeah, you're talking about my grandma. You're talking yeah. about Grandma Nettie. Yeah, oh, grandma yeah. Nettie. Oh, yeah. Family, faith, and schooling 110% through and through, uh, you know, at two years old, <laughs> teaching me to write my ABCs, uppercase and lowercase, on a sheet of paper bigger than myself, uh, you know, reading passages from the Bible, having me, you know, become introduced to that, too, as well. And uh and baseball was in there too. She loves sports. So she loves uh, sports. big Tigers fan, but also just a big fan of any sport that was on television as well. Did did she have favorite teams besides the Tigers? She was definitely a hometown, you know, uh faithful. So she would she would definitely watch the Tigers a lot. Um, and the Pistons and the Lions, of course. Uh, occasionally the Red Wings. That was the one sport she wasn't really into as much was hockey um but she really liked track and field and all that so um she would she would root for whoever you know was playing well and she wanted to see you know a great match um she wanted to see people really compete at the highest level and so she was really um into I bet the she had that so uh, yeah i was gonna say i bet she had fun with the bad boy pistons Oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> bad boys and, and, and bad boys too you know 2004 yeah. squad too so uh, yeah. She definitely enjoyed watching all of that. Uh, she was she would cheer so loud, you know, and she was critical. She was critical in terms of, you know, wanting to see a really good game. Very similar to my grandfather, as I found out mm -hmm. when I was researching him and and learning more about his journey. You know, I think people from that time period really expected and almost demanded excellence. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Otherwise it was like, go sit down. Don't waste our time. You know what I mean? Um, Which is, which is great to see because I think that taught a lot of us growing up. We're looking up at at them as role models, the power of maximizing your potential. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. Well, they did that. You're doing that now. Uh, You mentioned the tigers and one of the biggest ironies that I read in the book is the Tigers were owned by Walter O. Briggs, Sr. And then when your grandfather left baseball and he took a job at a foundry that happened to be owned by Walter O. Briggs, Sr. Can you talk about that dynamic? Yeah, you know, it's shocking that he played for a man. I mean, I'm sorry, he worked for a man and could, you know, make cars for a man uh, who essentially said, hey, I don't want you on my team based off of the fact that you're less than worthy, you know, and I wouldn't say based off the fact that he was black. I think a lot of people say, you know, well, the reason why I couldn't play for the Tigers is because he was a black man. Actually, the way Walter Briggs was talking about black people and specifically looking at the language that he was using and saying no jigs with Briggs, um, he he was dehumanizing black people. He didn't view them as human. So um, that's why they were not allowed to play for him and they were not allowed in his clubhouse. So it it was really shocking to learn that my grandfather was so grateful for the job and not harboring any resentment or any bitterness or any negativity. He was just, again, grateful to have a job, grateful to be able to contribute to work, uh, to be a big part of the Motor City. And um, that just speaks volumes about the man that he was. But it's definitely a bitter pill to swallow when you're researching that and learning about that because it was like wow you had this superstar right in your plant like all you had to do is right in front of your face all you had to do was reach out you know and see him Uh, so the fact that again he was invisible to Walter Briggs it just shows you you know um, how horrible times were back then and and how that's impacted the present too right right What do you see now? You you just mentioned the presence and there's just so much going on right now in our political discourse and yeah, banning books and things like that. Uh, What do you see right now? What do you see for improvement maybe or how it can improve? It's going to take a lot of people standing up for what's right. It's going to take a lot of people utilizing their voice. Um, Mm -hmm. and, And I think a lot of times people think that they're not involved in this or that they're not affected by this. But, you know, racism is like a conveyor belt and we're all moving all the time, whether we want to or not, you're on that conveyor belt. So what are you going to do to actually recognize it, turn around and walk the other way? Like what actions can you take in your life, at your job, interpersonally, looking at, at your friends, looking at your social circles, you know, just really every facet of life, kind of peeling back the layers and, and rolling up your sleeves and and getting in there. But, you know, you mentioned the books. I mean, we're talking about my book right now. Realistically, the way we're heading, a book like mine would be banned, right? People wouldn't want young kids, especially in Florida to re- or in Texas, uh, to read this historical information that's factual, uh, you know, just trying to shield young people from the truth. Um, it, it's disheartening to see that. Um, but I think if people are really paying attention to the intentions behind it, uh, we can recognize exactly where that's coming from. And we need to think about what type of world do we want for our future? And how, can, like I said, how can we get involved and, and make some some changes and not just some changes, but sustainable changes, things that will last beyond our lifetime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it it just, it amazes me because I know for an absolute fact, I mean, I'm in my mid sixties now, but when I was, when I was in middle school, they had what were called the weekly readers. And I was, they they could count on me that I would always order the sports books, baseball life of Willie Mays, baseball life of Henry Aaron, baseball life of Sandy Koufax. And while, especially for Willie and for Hank Aaron, Although the racial things were glossed over in the mid 60s, they still were in there. And middle school students were capable of reading about it. And in 2023, middle school students are capable of reading 
you know, your your story about your grandfather. And Absolutely. it's a learning experience. Now, what they do with the information after they read it, you know, a discussion with their parents or a discussion with their teacher, but they're definitely capable of reading it and expanding their knowledge. Yeah, and they're the future, you know, and they understand this stuff, which is, I think that's why there's such a huge push. I think some of the people from the older generation and people who are not culturally competent and don't want unification in our world are starting to recognize, especially through all the innovation and, and the amazing opportunities to come together, that young people are very, very intuitive and they're able to grasp information quickly and they really understand and have a strong sense of right and wrong. And so a lot of times when I'm teaching, for example, and I, I have mostly 16 year olds that I'm teaching right now, uh, they are fully aware of racism, discrimination, segregation, um, and honestly, the majority of them don't stand for it. And they are just appalled at things that have happened in history and they're shocked, but they also recognize how it's impacting where we are today. And they do a much better job of being more intentional about, you know, uh, being respectful to all and lifting people up and empowering people and um, just honoring each other. So I think that's one reason why people want to shield young people from learning more because the foundation for love is already there. And, you know, as they continue to grow up, obviously they will make sure that everyone feels included in this world. And uh, there's people that don't want that. Right. Well, that's our hope. I mean, that's our hope that kids are learning. And like you said, they're not standing for it and they're going to come of age. And that, that's our hope for the future. Right. 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 Now, another fun part of the book is your whole family went to Cooperstown when your grandpa was inducted, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Except for grandpa, right? The, right. The, well, that, uh, and that's a tragedy. He didn't live to see it. Right. So the main person who should have been there you know, was not able to, um, because that was 21 years after his death. Um, I was 16 at the time. So I was very, very young version of myself right. still taking it all in and, and not really understanding, um, the full experience of how amazing I knew it was amazing. And I knew it was a great honor, but looking back, I'm still blown away that we were able to have that opportunity and that my grandmother was able to give the speech on behalf of my grandfather. So um, we spent so much time with Buck O'Neill. He was like our escort the whole time. And so if we couldn't have gran grandpa there, it was amazing to have Buck O'Neill with us. Um, Sparky Anderson treated my grandmother like family. Uh, they hit it off right away. Wow. So I don't know if it was the Detroit connection or what, but you know, they were like fast friends. And you know, every time I look up, they're like joking with each other, or putting their arm around each other and different things like that. So it was really cool to see how uh, the people in um, in the induction ceremony, you know, treated my grandmother with so much respect and just how welcomed um, they made her feel. So that, it was uh, a great experience. It was really fun. That's that's great. Your grandmother knocked that speech out of the park, didn't she? She's a legend. I, that was... <laughs> <laughs> that was just her being her, you know, she was born for moments like that and she embraced it. It was so funny. Like looking back, I was watching her the whole time. You know, I, now that I'm 40 years old, I, I reflect on things a lot more, especially since she's not with us anymore. And I miss her so much. And I think about how much I was watching her during that time. And she was not sweating. She was not nervous. Uh, she she just felt like she belonged there. And really, to be honest, she did. And mm -hmm. she had worked so hard to get my grandfather into a place where he actually could be considered for the Hall of Fame. So I think she knew she belonged there. She knew grandpa belonged there and she was ready for her moment. I mean, she's a primetime player. Put her in the game. She's going to hit a home run for you. <laughs> well, well, she sure did. She sure did. So we're here today with Vanessa Ivy Rose. Her book is... Hall of Fame DNA, the legacy of Norman Turkey Stearns. I encourage everybody to go out and get it. Where would you suggest people buy it? Amazon. Amazon. Amazon's the best. That's where I got it. Number one spot for it. Uh, it might be still be on sale right now. So definitely check that out. Um, and then leave a review. Let me know 
what you all think of it. I, I definitely felt a little nervous putting this out into the world because now literally anybody can read it and respond to it. But uh, the feedback that I've gotten so far has been amazing. I'm so grateful that people are really connecting with the book and found it to be uplifting and emotional in all the right ways. So um, I, I love the book. Like I said, it's a love story from Vanessa to her grandpa. And it, it just, it really moved and inspired me. So I encourage everybody to go out and get it. And then you're also involved with the Negro League Family Alliance. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a phenomenal group of people in the Negro League Family Alliance. Uh, we have, you know, Buck Leonard's family, Josh Gibson's family, um, Ron Teasley's family, uh, so many others, right? And so... Um, Pete Hill, um, but we, and and also um, Rube Foster's family too as well. So as family members, we wanted to make sure that we honor, you know, the players who are in our families and protect their legacies, but also, um, you know, create opportunities of in the future for young people. And so we have a multitude of different initiatives and different projects that we're involved in. A lot of the people in the Alliance already have foundations and so they're doing a lot of individual work, but we wanted to come together as one family and one voice uh, to make sure that, you know, we create more opportunities and continue to talk about the legacies of these amazing players and, and make sure that they are, uh, you know, getting their credit and getting their acknowledgement too as well and spreading that information, spreading awareness. So it's it's been fun. Um, we meet often and we're continuing to grow as an organization. And we just had our, our first um press conference a couple months ago. And then we also had our May 2nd event, the Detroit Tigers um, recognized the Negro Leagues Family Alliance Day as uh, the Negro Leagues Day too, as well, because the May 2nd is the day of the first ever Negro Leagues game. So mm -hmm. uh, the Detroit Tigers were the first ones to jump on that and, and let us have an event. So that was pretty cool, even though the game got rained out. So that was sad, <laughs> but uh, we still, still had an opportunity to speak to the public and, again, share information about the Alliance and, and our players. But that's something that hopefully we can continue to look forward to in the future. We're going to make sure uh, that we have uh, recognition within all of Major League Baseball moving forward. And uh, we're making some progress with that, too, as well for next year. So well, a lot of stuff to look out for. Um, we do have a web website. Negro Leagues Family Alliance .com. Uh, We're on social media too, as well, on every single platform. So, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Feel free to check out the information, especially on the website, and learn more about us. Fantastic. I will put the website into the show notes so everybody can get it. And it's a great website. Uh, I think there are 10 founding members of some fantastic ball players and human beings. Absolutely. That's the best way to describe it. You know, again, you know, just one big family and making sure that uh, we preserve that black excellence within baseball and create opportunities for others uh, within the game, too, as well. All right. Fantastic. So uh, Vanessa Ivy Rose. Hall of Fame DNA, the legacy of Norman Turkey Stearns. Thanks for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a good time talking to you. I, I enjoy speaking with you. Just incredible stories. And I just wish you much success. Thank you so much. Right back at you. Thank you, Vanessa Ivy Rose, for the great conversation. And thank all of you who listened today. I will put the information that Vanessa gave me about the Negro League Family Alliance into the show notes. Let's keep in touch. I enjoy spending time in the community. If you would like to hear more about the Negro Leagues, I'm available to speak in person or virtually at your service club, youth group, religious organization, or your Toastmasters club. Just reach out to me by email. My email address is in the show notes. And also hit me up on Twitter. I love to hear what you're passionate about. My Twitter handle is at MarathonMax1. I would be grateful if you would like, share, comment, and subscribe so this message will go far and wide. And we'll find that shiny needle of common ground 
in that haystack of fear.